Om Aganati Manandas Yanganangana Salakya Chaksurun Miritam Yanatash Mahi Sri Gurve Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Vistam Stapitam Yanabhutare Sayam Rupa Karamayam Tarati Saparantikam Vande Hom Sri Guru Siyata Parakamanam Sri Gurun Vaishnavam Sha Sri Rupam Sagatatam Sahagana Raganatam Bitam Stam Sadevam Sadvaitam Savarutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Siddhartha Krishna Paran Sahagana Larita Shivishakan Bitam Stam He Krishna Kuru Nisindu Dinu Bandu Jigat Pate Gopisha Kapika Kantara Kantanamos to him Jayatam Surito Pango Mam Vendir Matir Kiti Matsavasha Param Bojara Ramadanam Seaman Rasa Rasaram Vivam Sivara Karsan Venesh and Ogbari Gopanata Sri Asanam Divyad Vrindaranya Kapudumada Srimad Radnagara Shima Sanasto Sri Sihirada Shri Govinda Deva Prasada Vihi Seva Manishmane Vihi Namo Brahmane Devaya Go Brahmane Taya Chaji Gadi Taya Krishna Ya Govinda Ya Namo Namo Mangalang Bhagavan Vishu Mangaram Guru Raduja Mangaram Padiri Kaksho Mangalaya Tano Hari Om Narayan Ayavid Mahi Vasudevaya Dimahi Tano Vishnu Pajodi Atehe Om Mahadevi Chavid Mahi Vishnu Padnita Dimahi Tano Lakshmi Pajodi Atehe Maharakshmi Namastubhyam Namastubhyam Sare Sare Hari Pare Namastubhyam Namastubhyam Dhirantare Tapti Kanjana Gauringi Rara Vrindavanishare Vishavana Sute Devi Pranamani Pare Pare Mukam Gavid Bakari Anshabarishmare Bhanga Gilanga Nade Kathari Gare Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Deva Heshwara Guru Shaksha Bhara Brahma Tashmai Shri Guru Vena Maha Durga Me Pati Me Andasha Skala Pati Amadu Shraki Prayasana Santu Santu Sharam Param Namao Vishnu Paraya Krishna Pasaya Bhuta Deshi Madhi Bhakti Vedanta Swami Dhanama Namaste Sarasati Devi Guru Adi Pacharini Nirvishesa Sanyuari Praskata Desana Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityana Shri Advaita Kadat Harshi Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare so I've got to catch you guys up on the weekend. First of all, happy sixth wedding anniversary to Natasha and Larry. We chatted Sunday feast. They met in Michigan and re-met again in Mississippi. And it just happened that sitting at the same table was, was Rahi, a volunteer from Gujarati Extraction, who was born and raised in Michigan. So they traded stories, Michigan stories, which was a nice connection. I was thinking, what a small world it is. <laughs> Good morning, Britta. Britta was very much a part of the Festival of Colors in Ogden on Saturday. She was there all day long. Her son came, went upstage to celebrate his birthday with everybody, got colored in colors, and then had a bit of a meltdown. <laughs> so his dad had to take him home mid-afternoon. But <laughs> Britta stayed the whole time, helped us take everything and pack it up. It was interesting because we'd had a neighbor call the city and complain that uh, the festival was responsible for leaving trash and some of the attendees were disrespectful to the neighbors and parked in their driveways. And so this was uh, something that was out there. And Ashley, who's the special events coordinator of the city of Ogden, is a great person. I just love working with her. But, you know, she has to, <clears throat> she has to listen to all this stuff. So... What we did at the end of the festival, we took a video of the park. It's totally evident that there wasn't a single piece of trash anywhere in the park. And in fact, it had stayed clean throughout the festival because people just picked up and we have a great crew headed up by Joshua. Make sure no trash stays on the ground. We filmed the parking lot and there was no colors on the parking lot whatsoever. We filmed all the trash receptacles that the city had kindly loaned us and they were all part one side and in fact the parking lot itself we probably had about 800 people but coming and going people come and go so maybe at one point in time probably not more than 350 or 400 we had 17 vendors and they all went away with smiles in their faces but the interesting thing was except for maybe an hour during the day the parking lot had empty spots and so this claim by this neighbor that there there is overflow parking people are parking in neighbors driveways leaving trash kind of hard to believe and also if you're as much a part of the festival as I am and you're up in stage and you're looking at the faces of people and seeing them smiling and hugging each other and dancing really hard to believe that um, these people are capable of disrespecting the neighbors parking their driveway and leave trash to the neighborhood so 
You know, I think there's always one, you know, right? The word neighbor, you know. When we applied to build this temple here, this world-class, beautiful temple, which attracts people from all over the country and all over the world, and certainly bumps up and boosts the local economy, the motels, the gas stations, and convenience stores and restaurants, the neighbors passed around a petition to ban the construction of the temple. So that's one of the things that neighbors do, you know. They try to insulate themselves. They try to rant and rail against anything that they imagine is a real or even a potential disturbance. They're suspicious of anybody who's not from the neighborhood, okay? And a neighbor is almost a prototype for the materialistic person. I remember in Berkeley, and in, in this case, we were a little bit at fault. If, if I'm at fault, I'll be the first to admit it, okay? So in, in Berkeley, we used to have Mangalarti, like 5.30 in the morning. It was in a residential neighborhood just, just off of um, Telegraph Avenue, granted, but it gets residential very quickly. And so there was one neighbor named Peter Epstein who was complaining about the noise from Mangalarti. And he was not, his claims were not unfounded. I realized in those days we were zealous to the point of annoyance. Um, but Jayananda gave, the, this is the one and only class that I ever heard Jayananda give, associated with him a fair amount. But this is the only time he was actually present, not out on the Rathiatra site or doing a, a flower run or a boga run. He gave class and he said, of the neighbors headed up by Peter Epstein there in Berkeley, if they're disturbed by a little pre-dawn chanting the names of God, imagine how their world is going to be rocked when death comes to tap them on the shoulder. <laughs> so we have to learn to tolerate things, you know? And the sweeping statement that the attendees of the Collar Festival are disrespectful to neighbors, leave trash in parking, is just bogus. It's just bogus. Now, there's always a bad apple in the barrel, and that's true, and I don't discount the fact that there might have been one incident at one particular point in time in all the 10 years we've been doing the Festival of Colors in Ogden, and I don't deny that, and I'm not, I'm not saying the lady's making stuff up, but I'm saying exaggeration, hyperbole, inflation. You know, this should not have been an issue that would have been, uh, that this, that uh, uh, what's her name, Ashley should have been bothered about. And so I hope taking the video, not a bit of trash. Um, the parking lot had empty spaces, except for maybe an hour during the heat of the festival, so it's hard to believe that there was much of an issue of overload parking. And even on the other side of the park, there's like uh, a quarter of a mile of parking on the other side of the street from the houses, just adjacent to the park. Um, um, anyway, enough said. I made a video, complete, hopefully definitive, conclusive video. That not only is the Festival of Colors not detract from the neighborhood, but it's a blessing. Um, and Britta confirms that many of her own neighbors were there yesterday, as well as herself. And when she asked them what their opinion of the Vessel of Colors was, most of them said they're very, very happy that it's in the neighborhood. So along with a video that I sent to Ashley and Ryan, who's head of the Parks Farm, both of whom are great people and were extremely helpful, I said, you know, not only do we not want to find another location apart from West Stadium Park, but we definitely want to go back there because we feel that contrary to what this one neighbor said the majority of neighbors are very very happy to have us there and would be disappointed and we would feel as if we were letting them down were we not to try our level best to continue it there beautiful grassy park with play area for the kids and ancient shade trees it was a wonderful day two bands canceled on us mikey pocker got the date wrong because originally we applied for the 21st of May and the city granted it. And then a week or so later, they called us and said, oh, we, we made a mistake. You can't have it on the 21st of May because that's the date of the Ogden City Marathon. Thus, it was changed to the 14th. But of course, we'd already posted on the calendar sites, including Eventbrite. And then from Eventbrite, it went to other places. And as soon as it was changed, we did everything we could to, to change the date on all of the web-based calendar sites. But Eventbrite is kind of impersonal. You can never talk to a person. 
And so it took them months to make the correction. In the meantime, people had actually bought tickets thinking that the event was on the 21st of May. <clears throat> In any case, it went off very... So what happened was Mikey got his date wrong. One of our performers got his date wrong. Um, then Jai Krishna had eye surgery, had cataract surgery two days before the event. And so he wasn't... Um, he didn't consider it prudent for him to come with this man. So we had from 11 till five, 4, five hours of entertainment. We had one band. We had TK, Manvantara, and John, their bassist. That was Manvantara's there. So we had those three. And then we had Josh, who plays the lead guitar. And we had Johanna, who sings. Then we had Janardin, who does rap music and DJ. And, uh, and then, of course, Malini and Akanksha. So that was like six or seven entertainers to fill up five hours of uh, scheduled performances and I was there too and you know we did it not only did we do it but we had a great time a lot of the artists were able to use new music that they hadn't used before they were able to experiment I personally was able to bring out more of my rap music and rap songs than ever before and I think we nailed it Judging from the participation, enthusiasm, and the smiles on the face of the audience members in front of us, I think it was great. So moving forward, I'm actually going to try to have less entertainers. It's quite expensive, the airfares, the motels, the fees and everything. Um, whereas most of those who came this weekend worked for just the bare minimum. Um, yeah, I've learned a lot. I learned a lot from Ogden. Thank you, Ogden. Thank you, Britta, for all of your feedback from the local members. It was a great, enriching weekend. Now, not only, not only did our crew from Spanish Fort drive to Ogden on Friday afternoon, set up the stage, and spend the night in the motorhome there, but we hit it at 7.30 the next morning without shower, without any breakfast to speak of, and finished the rest of the setup. We'd had a half a dozen volunteers sign up on volunteermatch.com, but none of them show, which was okay. Because we had myself, had Brad, had Joshua, had Brent, had Mike, had Elise, had Kira, had David. We had Britta join us. We had Daniel. We had Makunda. We had Sham Vihari join us later. We had a solid crew. and We had that festival set up and ready to go. At 10 o'clock, the doors open at 10.30. As I said, the entertainment from 11 to 4. Now, yesterday was the appearance day of Lord Nishringa, the half man, half lion, and Salt Lake City was having their observation. And so I had thought earlier, as long as we have the performers in town, why not have the performers come to the temple afterwards and be part of the celebrations for the half man, half lion incarnation? The main performer was supposed to be Malini. Um, however, her suitcase got diverted by the airline company. She never got her costumes. So she was not able to dance as we had advertised, unfortunately. However, TK stepped into the breach. He gave a wonderful talk about Lord Nishringa and he led an RT that was just like so memorable. Everybody was six feet up in the air. So it was a great celebration. And I had thought I might be late because we had to do this extra cleanup to satisfy the complaining neighbors, but you know, the crew was so efficient, especially Mike, who had all kinds of, when we were putting the, the boxes into the 55 pound boxes into the truck at the end, he, he got a, everybody into a rhythm. We had a, a line going, a bucket line, and Josh would take the boxes shoulder high, pass them next guy, pass them next guy, pass them. So all each person had to do was just swing box from right side to left side and stack it. So he got everyone saying, going and saying, swish, 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 swish. So you got eight people, swish, swish. It was, what an intelligent um, team leader he was. So we packed the whole festival up by 5.15, and we were at the temple by 6.30. So it was, it was a great action-packed day. I actually, and then we drove back after the, festivities and the feast we actually all drove back josh drove the motorhome with all the volunteers i drove the truck and we got to bed probably around 10 30 or so 
what a great day. I went to sleep with a smile and my, my body was totally wrecked, totally wrecked. I was limping. I have a tender spot in my shoulder where I broke my shoulder blade a few years ago. I, I was physically, I was in a depressed mode, but internally I was jumping for joy. And I'm still recovering, I'm still, re still catching up from uh, the toll that that took. But boy, when you can leave it all there for Krishna, that's a good day. That's a good day. The Ogden Festival was highly successful. I can't wait until we go back again next year. And if we don't see you again, which I'm, I'm sure we will, um, Britta, um, we're coming back. But we're doing whatever we can do to come back. Now, one thing I'd like to share with you also before we launch into our verse today, and the fact is, with so many things going on in the weekend, I didn't get much time to look at the verse or think about it. So I'm just kind of parling things out here. But this is one story. I know Govinda Dave heard this story. Uh, Natasha, no, Natasha wouldn't have heard this story. So here's, here's a story that TK told. He told three stories, but this is the one that struck me the most. On the, at the Salt Lake Temple. In Mayapur, they used to have a lot of trouble from local thieves and dacoits who would come into the temple property, beat up the devotees, and steal things. And at one point, they even launched a homemade bomb, which blew off the leg of a devotee named Bhakti Raghavad Swami. So he's a one-legged devotee because of all the trouble that the local dacoits there in West Bengal uh, performed. So um, Prabhupada said, get in the Sringadev deity, get the, a deity of the half man, half lion, uh, and he will give protection. He will extend protection to the devotee community. The particular deity was Ugra Nishringa. It's a it's a it's a deity of Nishringa with his teeth bared, his uh, you know growling with his claws out. He's very angry. Most people don't worship this particular form of the deity because it's it's unsettling. He's so angry. In fact, because the demigods and others stood by while his devotee Prahlad was tortured by his father Randikashipu. This Ugra Nishringa, the mood of Ugra Nishringa is, I'm going to destroy the universe. There isn't any person or part of this universe which deserves redemption when they all stood by, twiddling their thumbs, while Hiranyakashipu tried to kill my devotees. Narariya prashanti ashrashita paradini dinise pi varojitam. I am nishkapiya shakshad triyam bhagavadam tadomataram triyam. says, Prahlad was... Of all the living beings in the universe, he was the topmost. He was the one who was most dear to the Lord. And nobody intervened while he was being tortured by his father. And so Nishringadeva in this mood is thinking the universe is useless. It has no value whatsoever because nobody stepped into the breach to try to protect my devotee. So, uh, the Ugra Nishringadeva was installed in Mayapur some time ago and worshipped by one of the twins, Pankajanya. Now, a lady who almost on a daily basis would attend the temple and worship Lord Nisringadev as well as Panchatattva, she herself happened to have had a disease which had affected her eyes and caused her to be virtually blind. <clears throat> Everything that she saw was rather blurred. And so one day she appeared before the Nisringa or Ugu Nisringa deity and she's offering her obeisances with folded hands, and she hears in her inner voice, in her inner head, with her inner ear, I want my eyes back. I want this deep, resonant, somewhat angry voice. <laughs> I want my eyes back. And she's thinking, is this, is this some, some psychosomatic thing that's going on because my eyes are diseased? Is my mind unconscious mind telling me that I'd like to have my eyes back and the voice comes in no I'm not talking about your eyes I'm talking about my eyes and when you get my eyes back then you'll get your eyes back so she thought well that was pretty if there was any ambivalence before that made it pretty clear so she went to Pankajanya the uh, Pujari who takes care of the Nishringa deity and she said you're going to think I'm crazy but I, I just heard this deep really angry voice saying, I want my eyes back. And Panjajanya, he, did, he didn't even blink. He said, oh, okay. Okay, he didn't question it. 
He didn't think less of the lady. He just took it as a sign from Lord Nisringadev, his worshipful deity, that he wanted his eyes back. And Pankajanya knew the history that when they'd originally attained the deity, he had these red ruby-like eyes. But along the way, a very wealthy life member had given a huge donation and along with it, two emerald eyes. So the red eyes had been replaced by green eyes. So when Pankajanya heard this lady uh, narrate to him that she heard this deep, resonant, angry voice saying he wanted his eyes back, he knew exactly what was being referred to. And he said, okay. So the lady went home. Next day, she wasn't able to go to the temple, but her daughter came to the temple and went back and just happened to mention to her mother. Mother said, how was the Arshan? What was Lord Nishringadev wearing? Who led the Nishringa Arti? And so on and so forth. And the daughter happened to mention Nishringadev had different eyes this morning. And the mother is like, T say what? <laughs> yeah, Nishringadev had red eyes. All the time we've been going to the temple, he said green eyes, but today he had red eyes. And then the mother realized that this was Nishringadev's methodology for getting his original red eyes back. And after all, I think you'll all agree that in the mood of Ugra Nishringa, the red eyes is what happens when you get very angry. One of the things that occurs is that your eyes get red. And so Ugra Nishringa didn't think that the green eyes were in keeping with his mood. And so he wanted his red eyes back. And because that lady had been an instrument in getting his eyes back, eventually the macular degeneration, which had been taking place in her eyes, reversed itself. Her eyes regained their health and she began to see much clearer. That was of the three stories that uh, TK told yesterday. That was the one that stuck with me, obviously, most. Did I retell it okay, Govinda Dave? Was that an accurate recounting of the story? <laughs> Who's, who says this? This has got to be Anjali. I just ran across it. I just ran across it here. She says, uh, Grouch. Yes, Manja. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. I've got a lot of comments. We got the we got the comment queen here, Anjali. <laughs> Anjali always gets me laughing. Govinda Dave said he gave a check and he gave a thumbs up. So obviously he appreciated the story. Ram Kishore says, Jai, Lord Nishringadev, Ki Jai. Anjali says, quote, I want my eyes back. And she has an emoji of a lion with his arms crossed, like waiting impatiently for something. Where did you get that emoji? <laughs> Anjali. Uh, yeah, and Britta says, Mike's assembly line. She was there. So she knows exactly what I'm talking about, right? Wasn't he a genius for getting a, a team to work work together? Swish, swish, swish. Some really good comments here. Uh, there was one. Oh yeah, jo oh Govinda Dave said that some people follow Groucho Marx's mantra. Whatever it is, I'm against it. <laughs> you know, Britta pointed out that they have a rodeo. The park, we did the festivals right next to the rodeo grounds, and they have a rodeo every summer. And there's trash everywhere. There's drunk drivers. Um, and this lady picks on the festival colors to um, complain about. Anyway, I don't deny that, you know, incidents happen in any... You, you go to the grocery store, <clears throat> you know... You, you have a choice of picking out the fruit and putting it in your own bag. And when you pick it out, you make sure that everything's fresh and there's no blemishes on it. You put it in your own bag, you weigh it, you tie it up, and then you, you purchase it, okay? But how many times you've been in a hurry, you don't want to be bothered, and you just pick up the bag of oranges or the bag of apples. It's already pre-packed. It seems to have a good competitive price. You don't want to be bothered. And you, get, and you get home and inevitably hidden away where you couldn't see it from the outside, deep in the bowels of that bag, so to speak, there's one rotten orange or one apple with a worm. <laughs> see what I'm saying? So I, I'm not denying that maybe the festival left some trash. Maybe they parked on the driveway. 
Maybe they got into a little tiff with the neighbor, but to make a sweeping statement that the festive color disturbs the neighborhood, it, dis it destroys the peace of the area, it leaves trash, it has unruly people, is patently false. Thank you very much, and I will stand by that statement, and I have a video to more or less prove it as well. So we'd like to go back and be with Britta and all the nice neighbors in the West Stadium Park area next year. So let's now spend the balance of our time discussing the Srimad Bhagavatam. Last time we talked about how repression does nothing. Sadhu Shamtetetesha Prakadamagani. Prakadamagani Bunigarhamgani. Krishna, who's the Supreme Personality of Godhead, makes an extremely accurate observation to Arjuna. And he should be able to speak accurately because he made things turn out this way. He says to Arjuna, it's not a good idea to abdicate your position as a warrior, as a champion of righteousness, leave the battlefield and go live as a hermit in the forest somewhere. He says, repression accomplishes nothing. It'll just frustrate you. You may be living as an ascetic or a sage-like existence in a beautiful idyllic circumstances with beautiful lakes and swans and waterfalls and flowers all over the place. But as soon as there's an injustice, as soon as there's bullying, as soon as there's unfairness or cheating, you're going to, your ire is going to rise, you're going to pick up your bow, and you're going to step out to defend the downtrodden, to uphold the principles of justice. Why? Because that's who you are. And why are you that way? Krishna says, because I made you that way. I made you to be a champion of righteousness. And while violence is anathema to people in general, uh, we should not resort to violence. Uh, under any circumstances, there does require to be a class of men who are expert, who with surgical precision can use violence to cut out unwanted elements of society. Think of this example. A man comes up to you, he knocks you out, he lays you out horizontal on the slab, and he plunges a knife into you, good or bad? Well... It's not a clear-cut answer. If he's wearing a white coat, if he's been to medical school, if he's, if he's trained in surgery, if he's experienced doing many, many surgeries, if you have a tumor in your body which threatens the health and well-being of your entire body and which needs to be excised, then having an anesthesiologist knock you out which lay you out horizontal and having a trained surgeon plunge a scalpel in the, in the, in the interest of removing the, the tumorous growth, then that is not bad. That is good. That is good. Chatra means who can commit violence with surgical precision. Person whose senses and emotions are totally under control, who will not be provoked, who will not go around showing off, strutting his stuff, and taking advantage of those who are not trained or physically fit up to his level. But he will stand, step in the breach between the aggressors and the innocent people. That's who Krishna made Arjuna to be. So Krishna knows of what he speaks. He says, even a man of knowledge acts according to his nature, for everyone follows the nature he's acquired from the three modes. What can repression accomplish? So the same could be said of each and every one of us. Um, we're not all of the nature of Kshatriyas. Some of us are more intellectual. Some of us are more inclined toward intellectualism, peace and self-control, philosophy, poetry, um, even medicine, the doctors in the ancient times were also Brahmins. Then there are those who like to do mercantile work. They like to trade, um, barter. Um, they like to sell things for profit. And they're called the Vaishyas. And those who serve the other classes, artisans and craftsmen, those are called Sudras. So, Varnashramacharava Paraparam Vishnu Radhyateparam Nanyat Tato Shikaranam. God made four broad classes of men, each one with different aptitudes and temperaments, 
Just like we have in the body, the head part, which would be the Brahmins, the intellectuals. We have the arms part, which would be the Kshatriyas, the warriors, the defenders. We have the belly part, which would be the mercantile and the bankers and tradesmen. Then we have the legs, which would be the artisans and craftsmen. Uh, all different four parts of the body work in concert to keep the whole body whole and functioning. Similarly, society also has four parts. And if we want a smooth, running, harmonious, symphonic, so to speak, society, then everything has to work in order to satisfy Vishnu, the creator, the source of everything. Now, nowadays we don't have such organizational strata in our society. Things have gone south for many, many hundreds of years. And if there is the framework of a Varnashram society, it's now got a bad rap as the cap system. The, the way that it's played out over time has been that people claim priesthood, they claim Chatriya based on their birth, based on the parentage and the body they received from their parents without considering that one must qualify. Prabhupada says over and over, just because you're a son of a Brahmin doesn't make you a Brahmin. Any more than being the son of a brain surgeon qualifies you to be a brain surgeon. Now he does say that if you're the son of a Brahmin, there's a greater chance that you'll want to be a Brahmin and that you'll have available to you the training so that you can rise to the Brahminical platform. Just like if you're the son of a brain surgeon, you might admire your father, you might want to emulate and follow in the footsteps of your father, and your father with his connections and his resources can get you the training that you need to become a doctor. So it's true to say that the son of a Brahmin, the son of a Chatriya, has more opportunities to become a qualified Brahmin and Chatriya. But just on the basis of birth alone, uh-uh, no way. I'm not getting someone, I'm not having someone perform brain surgery on me because he's the son of a brain surgeon without having the requisite training. So in the absence of all these different <clears throat> categorizations, categorizations and divisions of society, we, we have the main thing. The main thing is Vishnu Arad, Vishnu the main thing is Tosha Karam, is by your actions, please Lord Vishnu. That's the main thing. And as they say in the wisdom of the sages, keep the main thing the main thing. As long as the main thing is the main thing, you're all right. So the main thing of caste system of Ranasham is to satisfy Lord Vishnu. If you can do that, then that will more than compensate for the topsy turviness of society today. Now, here's my point. Just as Krishna handcrafted Arjuna to be a warrior, similarly, none of us are created en masse through the assembly line. Each and every one of us is a result of the master craftsmanship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He made each one of us individually. He did not make carbon copies. You're unique. You're one of a kind. You have talents, abilities, and skills, which nobody else has. You have a contribution to make, which nobody else can do. You know, there's nobody like you in the entire creation of the Lord. And we're counting on you to use the gifts that God gave you to make this world a better place to live to help your friends and your neighbors and your associates, your generation, your species, the entirety of human existence and animal existence, we're hoping that you will do your part in order to make everything as good as it can be in this life and next life, we go back to home, back to God. And so it's very important that each and every one of us try to discover, first of all, affirm your uniqueness, you affirm your specialness, some people say, well, true, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what the mistakes I've made. You don't know this and you don't know that. Yep, it doesn't matter. One time we did a festival of colors in uh, Yankee. No, it was Yankee Stadium in New York, but it wasn't the Major League Yankee. It was the Minor League Yankees. And the stadium wasn't in, in uh, Manhattan. It was in Staten Island. But um, this guy, Alex Boyer, who's a local hero, performer, he happened to be out in New York and he came on stage and he gave a wonderful example, I'll never forget it. He took a $5 bill and he scrunched it up and he, he put it through the dirt and everything. He said, look at this $5 bill, look at the 
so-called starry, sorry state this $5 bill is. It's all wrinkled, it's crunched up, it's dirty. But I can still go out and use this $5 bill to get $5 worth of merchandise. So yeah, no matter what you've been through, no matter what bad decisions you made, no matter what family you came from, no matter whether you're educated or uneducated, you are still one of a kind. God made you, he stepped back and he said, another masterpiece. And so we need to step, spend some time before we prostitute ourselves just for a big salary or money, before we go to school for eight or 10 years just to do what our father wants us to do or what our uncle wants us to do or what we think society wants to do. We should take some time, take a breath, so to speak, in your life and examine who it is that God created you to be. In what areas are you uniquely gifted? Some people are good at mechanically and other people can't do anything mechanically. Some people are good with words and other people are not so articulate. Some people are strong and some people are not so physically strong. Some people are empathetic. Everybody tells their frustrations to them and they listen and they absorb it. And other people are, are not very empathetic. You know, they have their own schedule. They have their own things to do. And they don't really want to be, they want, don't really want to slow their momentum. Uh, uh, women are expert at nurturing and raising children. And men are expert at providing the, the, the roof over, and the food on the table. So everybody's different. And we need to find out where, what is the thumbprint of God upon me? What in what way did God make me so that I can act as an expression of the things I love? If you find the thing that you love to do and you do it, I guarantee you that money will come. Don't do what you do to win somebody's approval or to conform to society or just because it pays more. Do it because you love it. Statistics have proven that people who do what they love, like Steve Jobs, like the founder of Ikea, all the richest men in the world, none of them launched in their career paths with the idea of getting the approval of society or the amount of money they could earn. They did what they loved to do. They started out in a garage. They started out in a basement. They started out by borrowing $500. They could have hired off and made much more money in the beginning but they wanted to do, they drew a line in the sand and they wanted to do what they loved to do, what God anointed them to do. And those are the people who not only made a difference in the world, but who are the most wealthy, generally speaking. Personally speaking, one devotee named Pramarnava many years ago, he said, true, you're a really good public speaker. You're kind of quiet socially. You're not the life of any party. <laughs> you're more like a wallflower socially. But when you uh, get up on stage or when you get behind a microphone, um, it's amazing. It's amazing. You come to life. So that devotee gave me a hint um, of what it was that God anointed me to be. It was a public speaker. It was a communicator. Now, now we have, fast forward, and that was probably 1975 or so that he, planted that seed or watered that seed. Now look at look at what I'm doing. We just had the Ogden Color Festival. We had the, the Vegas Color Festival. We had the Spanish Fork Color Festival. Who's on stage? Who's the MC? Who's making the announcements? Who's filling the dead time between the bands? Who's preaching to the crowd? Who's uh, capsulizing our philosophy in terms of rap songs and rap lyrics? It's moi. It's yours truly. We came to Utah originally because we had the chance to buy a radio station. Why did we want to buy a radio station in Utah? Because I was doing radio in Los Angeles as a life membership director. It was effective. I loved it much. But it was a little too expensive to think of acquiring a radio station in the Los Angeles market. So we looked around. And so we came here originally to Utah to buy a radio station so that I could essentially be communicating 24 hours a day, even on days off, even while sleeping. That's why we came here. We built a wonderful temple, which is unique in the architectural history of America. It attracts tourists. School groups come. 3,000 school children come on field trips on the average annually. 
tourists come off in droves of, of I-15 for lunch, for um, uh, seeing the animals and experiencing the atmosphere. We've got the Sadhu Sun coming in two weeks' time. 1,500 devotees are going to come and enjoy kirtan and prasadam right here at this very location. Are you seeing a commonality? Are you seeing a thread in all of this? And it's in order that I be able to utilize to the highest degree the gift that Krishna gave me for communicating. These Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday <laughs> sessions, the Saturday, Sunday talks, same thing, communicate. And I can tell you, without any reservation or hesitation, I love my life. I love every minute of it. Look at me. I'm smiling. I can't believe how lucky I am that Krishna is giving me almost daily, almost hourly, almost by the minute opportunities to communicate. Um, everything that has occurred in Utah is simply the result of my pursuing a passion to communicate. My Bobby, my lifelong companion of 52 or 53 years, she loves art and she's incredibly gifted and talented. She never got an opportunity to build temples when we were living in Los Angeles. So for the same reason, she supported me. She was my inseparable friend when I came up with this crazy idea of buying a radio station in Utah. And as soon as the radio station and land was paid for, the next, and my, my desire was well on the way to being satisfied, the next thing we thought is, well, how can we get Vai Bob into the middle of what Krishna wanted her to do? So we announced for building a temple. We told everybody, Vai Bobby is more than capable of building a temple. If you'll support her, you'll be extremely gratified at the result. And so she built a temple. It was one of the most beautiful buildings in all of America. And then we said, well, build another one in Salt Lake City. She did that. And in between building the temples, she did the artwork. She did the carving. She did the paintings. So the te temples are decorated up to the highest conceivable standard. In so many ways, her hand permeates every single square inch of both the Spanish Fork and the Salt Lake properties. People's jaws drop at the painting, the architecture, the landscaping, the amazing things that Bai Bobby has created here. And all this, all this has come about because we're doing what God gifted us to do. If you want to have an easy time. Said that if you get in the middle of what Krishna created you to be and to do, then difficult things become easy and easy things become difficult. How difficult does it sound to go from a major city, a comfortable position in a big temple like Los Angeles to Utah where there's nothing, no devotees, no Indian community to speak of, no resources, and plant a temple, not one, but two temples in a radio station in an area that's 90% another religion. That's ha that doesn't sound difficult. That sounds impossible. But can I tell you it was easy? And why was it easy? Because we weren't trying to be something that God didn't create us to be. We were just trying to be better versions of the persons that God created us to be. And it's been an incredible ride. It's been unbelievably satisfying, unbelievably meaningful, and unbelievably purposeful. And if our example can infect and inspire others, then so much the better. Utah is the headquarters of multi-level marketing all over the world. Most of the multi-level marketing schemes originate in Utah. So if what we as devotees have planted in Utah can inspire and challenge and infect younger up-and-coming devotees all over the world, then that's so much the better. It says that a king, whatever pious activities his citizens do, he gets one-sixth of that. So if anybody's inspired by following the talents and gifts that God gifted him for, then and they take us as a page of their book, as a chapter heading, and go out and do what God created them to do, follow it in the footsteps of ourselves and so many stalwart devotees who found what it was that God created them to do. They stepped out of the boat. They stretched their faith. 
and they found that they were not in the least bit disappointed. It says that if you give up $5 for Krishna, Krishna will return you a million dollars. So there are devotees that hold on to their $5 that are full of fear and trepidation. They're concerned with security and they never realize the fullness of Krishna's presence in their life. If you give up that $5, make the investment to see who it is that God created you to be and then be true to that. God, Krishna will give you millions and millions of dollars in return. And it's important to note that within those millions and millions of dollars, there are so many $5 bills. So I present myself and my wife before you as those who are fully verified, fully satisfied by the promises that Krishna has made and Krishna's ability to uh, execute, to fulfill those promises, to accomplish those dreams in a bigger and a better in a more grand way than we could ever imagine. So we hope that some of that rubs off uh, to each and every one of you. I know that it's already done so, with many of you. That's our, that's our conclusion for the day. Be who God created you to be. Thank you. All right, uh, let's see what the comments are. Jayashri Radhe, she says, it's a miracle. True and by Bobby empowered. Lord Chaitanya is so kind, he is handing out this devotional service to everyone freely, but I have hardly found anyone who wants it. And isn't that the message? This is our literally 21st session on the statement of Narada Muni, who became a transcendental spaceman. He was a child at risk, orphan, didn't know his father, his mother died at five years old, and yet he became Narada Muni. Uh, Narada Muni, like his quotes make up like 30% of the Bhagavatam. Who would have thought? Who would have picked Narada Muni to be the great sage he was based on his birth and his circumstances and upbringing? So basically Narada Muni is saying, if I could do it, you could do it. Every one of the contributors of the Bhagavatam, why would they bother to be quoted and to enact these pastimes which are displayed in the Bhagavatam, if it were not true that each and every one of us could be like them. They're saying, if I could do it, you could do it. Otherwise, there's no need for the Bhagavatam. If you're encased, if you're condemned based on your birth or your upbringing or your level of intelligence or your gender, if you're condemned to stay where you are, why would the sages <coughs> give us, hand us down <coughs> these inspiring stories of people who came from nothing to become exalted saints and sages. And so the only qualification is that you have to want it. There's no lack in terms of Lord Chaitanya's mercy. There's no lack of opportunities. There's a whole world out there full of people swimming in an ocean of ignorance. But you have to want it. You have to want the special mercy of the Lord. And Jairati says she personally has hardly found anyone who wants it. We are trying, trying, to give devotees opportunities, but they prefer to work a job to the end. She says, I'm meeting devotees, men and women in their 60s and 70s, still working a job in order to pay a rent for an apartment. It makes no sense to me. Krishna has handed me as much service as I wanted, but to try to expand so others can get the opportunity. They're not ready to come forward. It says, if you want results that others are not gonna get, then you have to be willing to do things that others are not willing to do. Well, anyway, thank you. John Atarni says, Bhai Bhavi is the most gifted artist and wonderful pure devotee. We are lucky to have her association. Thank you very much. Pragna from Texas gives us a hearty, hearty, hearty bowl. Britta says, I sure think of retreating from the entanglements of this world, but it's also in my nature to champion justice. Yes, Britta is the activist, transcendental activist. Kurt Gordon, I wanted to jump into the Ogden River and clean out all those tin cans. Well, we didn't put them there. <laughs> we might get blamed for it, but we didn't use any tin cans. Anjali says, I want my eyes back. Oh, a lot of comments. We're gonna have a record number of comments this morning. In inspiring, Ram Kishore. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you all. If you weren't out there, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. Every communicator needs someone with whom to communicate. So 
we're in partnership. And Ram Kishore, now talk about abilities and talents. We have our relevance committee meeting every Wednesday nights and Ram Kishore is like on top of it. I don't know anything about committees and strategies and timelines. This fellow is like, he's created, God made him the ultimate corporate organizer and he's lending those talents so that we can do our little bit to provide more of a, more, give ISKCON more teeth in terms of modern society and reaching out to people. You know, we get some flack from the Festival of Colors because we have Bollywood dancing. And one, one uh, commentator, one person with an initiated name, after he saw a clip from Las Vegas of the Bollywood dancing, he said if Prabhupada were here, he would beat the crap out of Chiru. <laughs> <laughs> so it's true, we get some flack. However, we had, a, we had a volunteer. She's here right now. She helped us with the Vegas Festival. Uh, no, she helped us with the Ogden Festival. <clears throat> she goes to class every evening. She attends Mongol Arti. She's showing a keen interest in Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> her name is Kira. So I asked her uh, about her background. She said that she has some friends in Utah and she'd been to the Festival of Colors in September. Okay, now she'd been to the Festival of Colors in September. She signed on as a volunteer. She lives here. She works four hours a day, six days a week. She doesn't have to attend the classes. She doesn't have to take an interest in Krishna Kanji, but she's showing an active interest in attending the classes and in chanting all the other things. And so I said, when you went to the festival in September, what did you like the best? And she said, without hesitation, the Bollywood dancing. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, uh, my, my point is that each and every one of us has strengths in areas that others are weak. So if, if you're strong in an area and others are weak in it, don't criticize them, don't condemn them. If you're weak in an area that someone else is strong, I'm strong in communication. I'm strong in reaching out to audiences all over the world. And I've got 55 years of experience. So just give me a break, okay, guys? You don't know everything, you know, sitting behind your computer, making critical remarks and sarcastic using profanity, okay? We actually got on Saturday about 900 people to chant Hare Krishna for the first time in their lives. And not only did they chant for the first time in their lives, but they chanted for hours with some breaks for Bollywood dancing. That's how we got them there in the first place. Thank you very much. But for the first time in their lives, they chanted Hare Krishna and they didn't just chant it once and done. They chanted for hours and hours and hours with big smiles on their faces. They drank in the Krishna consciousness and they began to connect the dots. They began to see how their talents and abilities could be used in a God-centered way. So don't criticize. Better you spend your time, rather than comparing and envying others, better you spend your time figuring out what Krishna made you to do and step in the middle of that. And if you do that, you're not going to have time to sit around and throw sticks and stones at others. That's my advice to all of our cheap critics. So thank you very much <laughs> for being with us. We'll be back tomorrow, Transcendental Tuesday. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Rama Rama, Hare.